I don't want women to play hard to get. I want them to be hard to get. And that's a very different thing. You don't have to be catty and manipulative in order to display the high status that speaks to men. This is episode number 510 with Duana Welch, the fine line between high status and hard to get. Hi, everybody. I'm Sandy Wiener, and welcome back to Last First Date Radio, where we believe it is never too late to go on your last first date. And to support you on your journey, I wrote a book called Becoming a Woman of Value, How to Thrive in Life and Love. It's filled with 30 tips and stories and exercises to help you build your core confidence to really help you thrive in all areas of life and love. And every week I share a tip from the book. This week's tip is step 11, which is don't be a people pleaser. Speaking from a perspective of a former people pleaser, when, and so many of my clients come to me with this being really something that gets in the way of them finding an authentic relationship because when we are people pleasers, we're actually not showing up as ourselves. We're showing up to conform to somebody else's needs and giving up often what we need in the process and not being bold enough to speak up and express what we need and want in a relationship. And so my challenge to you this week is if you are saying yes to something that is actually uh, at a cost to your own needs, just to take a pause, maybe even give it 24 hours before responding so that you're responding from a more authentic place and really aligning with your core values instead. And before I bring Duana back uh, on, and she is a returning guest, so we're excited to have her. Just wanted to give a shout out to my Facebook group, Your Last First Date. This is a wonderful place for you if you're a woman over 40 and you want positive support with a highly moderated group, which is very unusual in the group space on Facebook or anywhere else. This is not a place to just come and complain. It's a place to come and grow and really be positively supported, not, you know, not a place to talk about how awful dating is and how awful men are and, and complain all the time because that doesn't get you anywhere. And so join us at your last first date on Facebook. And now for my guest, returning guest, Dr. Duana Welch, she is the coach and author who is known for applying social science to real life relationship issues. She's the author of a series of books um, called Love Factually, and she's an expert for couples app called Paired, and she is an international dating coach. And you can find her at lovefactually.co. Welcome back to the show. Thanks so much, Sandy. It is a delight to be back on. I really enjoyed our last visit. Me too. So I know you republished your book, Love Factually. Is that the, the first book? Yeah, Love Factually, 10 Proven Steps for My Wish I Do is out in its revised and updated edition. As you know, all my work is based on science rather than opinion. And it's just like a conversation, but based on facts. And the facts didn't stop happening just because I wrote that first edition. Science just <laughs> went right on being science. And so I have updated with a lot of information that uh, delves into one of the topics we're going to talk about today, I think, which is uh, what's the difference between being hard to get in high status and um, you know, what's, how do you not be manipulative and all that? That's in there. I've made that much clearer in this edition, but there's also a lot of stuff about, um, you know, basically human nature didn't change, but dating did because of dating apps quite a bit in the last seven years, it changed. And so I've got a lot of science on that specific thing and how to put the odds ever in your favor as Katniss Everdeen would say. <laughs> Yeah. And a lot has changed. Definitely a lot has changed. And we see this in my Facebook group all the time. The men chase, women have to play hard to get, never pursue. And there are still Facebook groups and books and lots of experts out there saying a high value woman always never makes the first move and she always plays hard to get. And uh, so why, why do we still talk about this? This feels really, really old fashioned. 
So I want to talk about birds for a moment and then I'll get to people. When we see birds doing a mating dance, when we see the male doing a dance and say the male bower bird, he shows the female his bower, he's decorated it with lots of objects, sometimes pieces of shell or mirror and different kinds of grasses. And she shows up and she looks at it and he does a dance. He shows her the, the nest and she decides whether or not she's going to choose him based on what he's achieved and, and how he's moving, basically. He's showing his fitness. And we don't say, oh, look at those cute little birds. They're playing a game. They're not playing a game. They're doing something that's really quite serious when it comes to mating. Now, they're not consciously aware of what they're doing, but research would indicate that the reason that female bowerbirds are particular about certain things from the males is because those males are more fit as providers and they are more genetically fit. We know this for sure with peacocks. You know, Darwin said he felt sick to his stomach every time he saw a peacock because the peacock's train is so long and heavy. When it raises that train and displays to a female, it cannot see it, most, it, more than half of its field of vision is compromised. It really can't see. And if a predator should come, it could be attacked from behind without ever knowing. And if it does know, it's hard to fold the train up quickly enough and fly far away enough to get away. So why would the peacock have this train? Well, it's because Evolution is not just about surviving, it is about casting your own genes forward. There's this idea that we're all sinking ships, that, that our, our body is our ship. We start out life in this beautiful ship and we cruise along as long as we can. But the thing is the ship is sinking. The ship will not go on forever, no matter what we do to maintain the ship. And so what do we need to do from an evolutionary standpoint? We need to make another ship that carries the, those genes forward into the future. Everyone in the world today is by definition the successor to ancestors who never failed. Not one of your ancestors failed to procreate. That's why they're called ancestors. They're not just part of human history. They're part of human ancestry. So the first thing I want to say is birds are not the only organisms. They're not the only creatures that have a mating ritual. We now know that when female pe when peahens select a male to mate with, they select the male who is most genetically fit to create the strongest, healthiest babies. And how we know this is researchers, first of all, they cut off eye spots on male peacock's tails to see if that's what females were looking at. And what they made the train shorter of some males that females had been preferring. And sure enough, females were choosing the males with the longest trains and the most eye spots, which I always say means when you're a peacock, size does matter, <laughs> not necessarily so much when you're a person, but when you're a peacock, it does. And they thought, huh, I wonder why the females are picking these guys and not these guys. So you'll see it with people too. When, when, when females don't have choice, say all the males are off to war and there are only five men left in the village. And you're of an age where if you don't have a child soon, you never will. Women will line up and have sex with the guys who are at home they'll do it. Usually females get to be choosier than males get to be quite a lot choosier in across many, many species. And so when they remove female choice, just like women during wars will choose whoever's there, peahens will choose whoever's there. And what they found is when they put a, a peahen in an enclosure with a poorly endowed male, a male with few eye spots, a shorter tail. She would mate because that was her only chance to cast her genes into the future. Again, she's not thinking that consciously. She's not thinking, uh, he's got kind of a puny tail, but uh, I've got to cast my genes in the future. I guess I'll do it. She doesn't have that thought process. She just knows what she wants. She'd prefer this guy over here, but that guy's not available. She chooses this guy. Well, her, her chicks have double the odds of death compared to the peahens who are put in an enclosure with a well-endowed male. So what females are choosing is genetic fitness. What does this have to do with us? Humans have a mating ritual. We are not playing a game. It's a shame that we have started thinking of it that way. It's, it doesn't need to be manipulative and it doesn't need to be mysterious. All we need to understand is, first of all, we have a mating ritual. Second of all, the reason we have that ritual is it gets us what we need in order to survive and procreate. By the way, if you're thinking, but I already survived, I already procreated, I've got all the kids I ever want, I don't even know if I want to get married again, I just want a good boyfriend, it doesn't matter. Evolution doesn't have an off switch. If it did, 
men in their 80s wouldn't still think women in their 20s look good, even if they can't have. If evolution haven't had an off switch, really wealthy women wouldn't care how wealthy a man is or how wealthy a prospective partner is. Hey, I'm really wealthy. I don't need yours. But we don't think that way. We want what our ancestors wanted, and we want it because that's what got them to survive genetically. Their genes live on in us, and we want what they wanted that got that to happen. I don't want women to play hard to get. I want them to be hard to get. And that's a very different thing. You don't have to be catty and manipulative in order to display the high status that speaks to men. There's a, I think she's a sociologist. I'm probably getting that wrong. Dr. Sarah Blafford Hurdy. She said um, that men are one long breeding experiment conducted by women. And what she meant by that is that because women, like many, many, many other species, we are the ones who actually choose a mate. That was one reason why Darwin's theory was so controversial, was because the idea that women get to choose, no, women, women have to take what's offered. They don't get to choose. Yes, we do. We, we are the ones who choose. And we always have because we have the resource that everybody wants, namely eggs. We're not endlessly fertile. Men have to pick a woman who is fertile. We get the choice. They can all procreate almost. We get the choice. So our female ancestors chose um, various men. And those who chose wisely, those who chose a man who could and would ably provide and protect over a long span of time, they had more surviving children. And so we are the inheritors of that choosy, picky psychology that worked for our female ancestors. Men, on the other hand, because we were so picky, they try to offer what we picked them based on. We picked them based on their success and their commitment. So if you look at lies, look at the lies that men tell and women tell. Women lie about youth and beauty. They put on makeup, they wear corsets, et cetera, et cetera, look throughout history. Those are effectively enhancements that don't really show the truth exactly. And I'm not saying we should not do that, but I'm saying, you know, we don't just usually walk out there just exactly how we rolled out of bed in the morning. Mm -hmm. And we, most people try to look, most women, most gay men, because anybody appealing to a man tries to give them what they want, which is youth and beauty. The sex that lies about age, mostly women, mostly gay men, not straight men, not lesbians, not people trying to appeal to a woman. Men tend to lie in the direction of offering what they think women want, which would be They'll say things like, oh, my parents got engaged here, or, you know, I'm just looking for the one. That's why I've never, never gotten married. Even if they're just playing around, they'll say things indicating that they want to offer commitment because women want that. Our ancestral mothers who got somebody just long enough to procreate did not cast their genes into the future nearly as effectively as those who got a man who stayed by their side and brought home the wild boar and protected them from other men and made sure they got their share of the resources of the of the group, et cetera. So when men lie, they lie about things that we want. Um, they'll lie about their height. Women don't lie about their height. Men do. Women prefer tall men. Men know it. Why do we prefer tall men? Well, if you look at hunter gatherer groups, even today, they refer to their leader as the big man. And the big man is the biggest man in the group. Almost always. He has more respect of other men. He's better able to defend his women against predatory behaviors by other men. Women value height and physical prowess because those things garner status among other men and therefore get resources and protection. Men lie about the things that women want, just like we lie about the things that they want. So why would a man work to either actually provide resources and commitment or fake that he's going to provide these things. Why would he do that when it's in his job, his car, his house, but then he'll just marry anybody? We have created a competitive subset of humanity. Men are much more competitive as a group than women are. Many scientists have found this. Shelley Taylor found that women tend to tend and befriend. We talk to each other and you know, our first names. If I go on a podcast with a man who has a PhD, he always wants to be called doctor. I have a PhD. I want people to call me Duena. There's a reason for that. It's not just that I'm nice. 
It's that I'm a woman and I have a different genetic legacy than a man has. I see the world differently. It's not just that I've been socialized this way, because if that were the case, we should see that societies vary a lot on this dimension, but we don't see that. We see consistency here across more than 37 different cultures and countries from hunter gatherer right to this one here today. So I don't want you to play hard to get. I want you to hook into men's mating psychology so that they can fall in love with you. Because if, if the peacock doesn't give the peahen the right signals, she walks away. That's not just their species. It's every species. Everyone's got to shake a tail feather in the way that their desired demographic wants it shaken. That's what we have to do. It doesn't mean that we have to play a game forever. It does mean we have to show some things that are appealing at the start. And then we can gradually, gradually more and more just be exactly how we want to be. Can you give some examples of what that looks like? So women have historically and prehistorically chosen men who offer um, provision of protection. And those men are competitive. Women have chosen men who are competitive. Women will almost always say something on their list of must-haves about he has to be ambitious. It, that's not just a random thing that we want. Men compete for everything. They compete for their job. Because we've desired this, men are this at this point. They are competitive. And so they compete to have the woman that they want. If you offer everything up on a plate to a man and he doesn't have to compete at all to have you, you have just cut the legs out from under his courtship and his ability to connect with you. Sometimes women find it easier to understand this when I talk about basketball. Imagine that you're you're dating a guy, you know, a guy who he's really into basketball and his team makes it all the way to the last, last, last game of the final four, his team and the other team, they make it to the last game and it's time for tip off. You're watching the game with him. You know, he's really into this. And the ref comes out and says, you know what? You're both great teams. I don't see why we should even play. I'm just going to flip a coin. And the one that gets heads wins. Do you think your boyfriend or husband or whoever it is is going to be satisfied with that outcome? Like, let's say his team gets the, the heads and they win. They take the trophy home. Does he feel good about that? No. No, he wants to play the damn game. He wants to see his team win. He's competitive. He does not want you to say, you know what? I'm in love with you. I'm going to have sex with you right away. And I'm just going to do everything for you. You won. You don't have to do anything. He doesn't want that actually. Let him do his job. He wants to do the job. He doesn't want to do it for just everybody. But when a man finds who he thinks could be the one for him, and she's just high status enough not to cater to everything he wants instantly, that's a turn on for him. Conversely, consider the ancestral environment where men evolved. They had to go and hunt for the group. There would always be some men left behind to protect the families. Now, if a man picks a woman who is devil may care with her sexuality, she really will sleep with anyone. How does he know that the babies are his? Keep in mind, we all have an unconscious program that says cast our own genes into the future. It's not just survive and procreate for the species. It's, it's selfish. It's very specific. When a woman has a child, it's a slam dunk. We always know I could have had sex with a hundred men the year that my son was conceived. And I still would have known who the, whose baby it was. It would have been mine, but, but the guy wouldn't have known if I'd done that. Griffin's dad wouldn't have known. So, you know, men's mating psychology does not come from the era of 7-Eleven, Walgreens, and paternity tests. It comes from under the ledge of a rock in a cave and, um, you know, foraging by a stream. That's where it comes from. There's no paternity test. There's no one who knows for sure who the daddy is. It's actually one reason babies look more like their fathers than they do their mothers. Because prehistorically, if a baby didn't look like the father, men would frequently refuse to raise them and those babies would be discarded. So this is serious business. When I say it's a mating ritual, men are choosing a woman who gives them the signals, not only that, A, I'm going to have to compete for you, which is such a turn on, even though I say I don't like it, I love it. And B, oh, if you're hard to get for me sexually, you're hard to get for everyone, which is a good paternity bet. You know, we're all gamblers, Sandy. We are all gamblers when it comes to love. When, when I started dating my, my sweetheart, who 
we're talking about getting engaged pretty soon. When I started dating him, you know, I had to make a bet that the things that I saw about him early on were really facets of his character that I could depend on over time. And one way that that we had our bets is we date for an extended time period. That's one way to do that. And to see somebody in a lot of contexts over time is a helpful thing to do. But at the end of the day, we are still rolling the dice. It's just whether we are, whether it's a total crapshoot or whether we have a lot of information and it's a pretty solid bet. He also is gambling. He's gambling that I'm not going to have sex with somebody else, for example. And how does he know that? Well, because, you know, I don't have sex with anybody until they're in love with me and until they tell me that they are in love with me and they prove it through their behavior and they ask me to be exclusive. And I advise that anybody who's interested in men behave in the same way. It allows men the time, it, it gives them the signals they need for their dopamine levels to rise, for them to fall in love and stay in love. And by the way, you don't have to be at all gameplay playing to do this. I said to the men that I began dating, I said, I just want to be completely clear. I know that women now usually get sexual on the first, second or third date. And I want to let you know that I don't, I don't get physically involved um, with anyone right now. It's pandemic uh, until, you know, I feel like I know the person really, really well. And uh, I don't get fully sexually involved until everybody's had an STI panel. And the guy has asked me to be exclusive and I want to, and he loves me and I can tell that he does. And so I get it if that's not how you want to live. And also, by the way, I assume this whole time you're dating around because I am. I want you to hear what I just said when I said that. First of all, I didn't play any games. I laid it right out there. You don't have to play games in order to speak to men's mating psychology and boost your own status and your own self-worth. Doing it this way feels great because you're not getting emotionally hooked into sex with guys who then discard you. That never happens this way. It just doesn't. It feels really, really good for you. And it gets men who just want to play the field to leave you alone, which is a win. It is a win when the bright, shiny object runs away after you say something like this. He was never going to be yours anyway. Men who think you're pretty cool, if they like you, they work to have you and they enjoy working to have you. Think about it. Have you ever heard a man brag that he got his wife in a bed on the first date? I've never heard this. No, no. And I, I, I really love what you're saying. It's, I mean, there's so much of my work is about woman of value and a woman of value is another way to say high status. It's you value yourself. And when you value yourself and you're clear about what you need to feel valued and to be valued in a relationship, you don't just, you know, do the people pleasing and, oh, I should sleep with him because he wants me to, or I feel coerced or everybody else is doing it. You know, you're really thinking for yourself and doing what works for you. I've seen too many women who say, I'm okay with casual sex. And as soon as they have casual sex, they have expectations. And then the man often will not be in touch and he will ghost them and he will not honor and respect them in the way that they want. And so we have to behave in a way, and I would say this about any relationship, we have to behave in a way that that first respects our own needs and takes care of what we need. And we're modeling what we, how we want to be treated in the world. And I think when we bring in the mating into this and the whole ritual around mating, it makes perfect sense. I remember even in my engagement, my husband was so set on getting married. He had asked several women before me, they all turned him down. And I was feeling like I, I really wanted to get married and he was the only one who asked. And so it wasn't like, I didn't feel chosen. I didn't feel like it was this incredible love connection. And as a result, there were issues in the relationship from the start. And I know I need it as much as I think men need it. I need to feel chosen. I think we all need to feel special. And the way to do it is not to just give everything up, you know, the, the make the four course meal on the second date. And that's so many women are like, oh, I want to have you over. And you, you know, you treated me to a meal. So I want to cook for you now. 
And it's, it's just saying like, you didn't have to do much to get that meal. Like you just, all you did was pay for one meal. And now I'm opening up my home to you. I'm opening up my heart to you. I'm trusting you without you earning my trust. So yeah, I mean, all of that. Let's take a quick break to hear from our sponsors. This episode is brought to you by Amazon Music Unlimited. You can listen to over 70 million songs and thousands of playlists and stations. Plus, you can now stream your favorite podcasts like Last First Date Radio. You can listen to any song, anytime, anywhere, on any of your devices, your smartphone, your tablet, your PC or Mac, Fire TV, and any Alexa-enabled devices like the Amazon Echo. Get Amazon Music Unlimited for free for 30 days. Just head on over to getamazonmusic.com forward slash last first date to learn more and claim this offer. We're very much on the same page with a woman of value, a woman of of high status, a woman of high self-worth. All these things are synonymous. And, um, you know, when, when you tell a man what your boundaries are up front, it does so many things for you. First of all, it sets you free because when you continue dating around while you're getting to know this one guy, you're not being duplicitous about it. You're not lying. You told him you're going to be dating around. Okay. So you don't have to think, oh, well, gee, if he still sees that I'm online, I see his online. Well, why I, question I get a lot from women. Well, why is he still dating online? Well, you're not exclusive yet. That's why, you know, just like I don't want you to give commitment that he didn't ask for and doesn't deserve. I don't want him to give you commitment right away either. You don't know each other yet. Keep getting to know other people until, and and it will happen. I think so much of this is just borrow my faith that you will find someone who feels this way about you and you will feel this way about them. And you will stop seeing other people when you both realize that. But you know, he does need to make effort and you need to let him, and it's okay to tell him, you know, uh, that you can, you can say, um, let's say you're dating online and the guy, uh, gives you his number. You can say, you know, I know it seems very 1990s to me, but I really prefer the guy to call me and be the one to ask me out and that kind of thing. And I get if that's not your thing, but it is my thing. So here's my number. And if you want to call, I'd appreciate, I'd love to hear your voice. And if you don't, that's no problem. And then stop communicating with him on the app. He will either call or he will not call. You don't have to get so invested in it. Mm -hmm. You know, when, when you feel, and again, you can act yourself into a way of feeling. I'm not asking you to really vibe with this right away. I'm not asking you to resonate with what I'm saying right away. I'm asking you to do things differently to get a different result. When you get the different result, it will feel great. You'll notice that, and it'll happen one day, there'll just be this ding, this shift where you realize I'm not attached to what any of these people do. I don't know them yet. Yeah. I'm just going to say what my truth is and I'm going to live according to it. And I'm just going to move on. And they will compete to have you more than if they got the message that Mm -hmm. uh, here's how one man put it to me. He said, you know, I know this isn't very PC, but I'm a lion and I'm looking for a gazelle. And if the gazelle runs toward me, I wonder what's wrong with it. (laughs) That's a good way to put it. I would love for you to share the story again. I think you may have shared it on the last podcast, but of the guy you dated before you met the man that you're involved with now, because I think the contrast is, is so such a good example of this. So if you could share the quick story about that guy, as opposed to the new, the guy that you're with, who's the good guy, that would be fantastic. Sure. And what's great is that Carrie, who's my sweetie's name, Carrie uh, has given me permission to share just pretty much anything I want to. So that's awesome. (laughs) (laughs) Because I asked him, I said, well, you know, where are the boundaries here? And he said, you're not going to say anything that's going to bother me. So, um, So yeah, uh, I had been uh, away from my husband at the time for about a year. We had been legally separated. We were going to divorce, but it was pandemic and he didn't want to leave me without health insurance. And so we were technically, technically married, but not really. We're waiting for pandemic to pass so we could divorce. 
And I was out walking my dog and I met this guy who was six foot five and good looking and had a, a master's, a PhD and a law degree. I mean, you know, <laughs> what's not to like fascinating guy. And I just met him walking my dog and he started showing up every day to where I was walking my dog and he had his dog and we would talk and, you know, then he got my number and my birthday came and he bought me chocolates and a card. And then, you know, he started calling every night and we would, the time would just fly. I, I was really excited about this guy. And, um, this is not my boyfriend, by the way, that I'm talking <laughs> about right now. Right. <laughs> this is a relationship that didn't work. Right. So so he, he asked me on a date and I said, well, um, I'm not getting within six feet of anybody. Um, so I, you know, how are we going to do this? Well, we, we realized, okay, well, if we quarantine two weeks, then we would know by definition, neither of us has COVID. Then we could go on a real date. And within those two weeks, he started doing things that men with an avoidant attachment style do and, or men who just aren't into you. One of those two things. I don't even care which one it is. Neither one of those things works for me. I know myself really well. And a big part of getting what you want is knowing what you have to have. And then when you see that the guy doesn't have it, even if he has 90% of the other stuff, just walking away. And that's the hard part, really. It's not difficult to jettison someone who's just a flat out mismatch. It's hard to say no to the person who has all the things. This is why I told you what catnip he was for me up front. That's why I told you that, because it's hard to say no to that guy. Yeah. And lots of women, by the way, get into those feelings for a guy who shows them all that attention up front. It is so easy to fall for that. Yeah. But there's a but, little hook here. <laughs> but the big but, um, <laughs> as soon as I said that I would go out with him, he started doing these really weird things that created distance between us. For example, he took his dog on a walk at the park, which is one or two blocks away from my house. He took his dog on a walk there and didn't call and tell me they were there. And then he called late that night because he apparently was waiting for me to court him. And he started making grumbling sounds about I needed to call him. By the way, my sweetheart, we've been together 14 months now going on 15 months. He calls me every night. I don't, he never says, why don't you call me? He loves doing it. Mm -hmm. So, you know, he, he got where this guy got where he didn't want to call me. He called me late. He, he went to the park that we'd seen each other at nearly every day. Didn't tell me about it till after he called late and then acted like he was kind of miffed and tired. And, and I said, you know what? I think we did the girlfriend dating thing a little quickly. And he said, what? And I, I said, you know, it just seems like you're less certain now. I'm getting some mixed signals now. Um, I don't feel comfortable with this. I think maybe we should take a step back and uh, maybe go back to being friends for a while and figure out whether we need to be going out. And I do not remember, Sandy, I don't remember exactly what he said, but I do remember no one's ever spoken to me like that before. It was really insulting. It was um, disrespectful and unkind. He took things that I had told him in confidence because we had talked a lot. I told him some fairly personal things and he used them to insult me. Mm -hmm. And I tried to back it up. And I said, I mean, I was having that moment of knowing, ah, this isn't going to work. But I, I said, you know, I, I wonder if we could like cool this off just a little bit. It feels like both of us are being kind of hard on me right now. It's, you know, why don't we just talk about how we're feeling about this and, and maybe how we can work this out. And he goes, well, I get to have my say. Mm. And I just, I said, that was the moment I was like, oh, we're so done. I said, <laughs> I said, well, you certainly do. And so I thought I will give him two minutes and then I'm going to get off the phone. So I gave him two minutes and I said, you know, it doesn't seem like this conversation is really working out. So I'm going to get off the phone now. And he goes, fine. And he hung up on me. <laughs> okay. So here's what I know from 27 years of being a relationship coach. Here's what most women would do. They would go ahead. They would make excuses for him and give him another chance. Yep. But I ask you, think about this. When you've seen that from a prospective partner and you've continued dating that partner, did it ever get better? Nope. 
I've never met the person where that got better. And because I do, and I'm not, I'm not meaning to denigrate anyone I've worked with by saying that. What I'm saying is I've got 27 years of seeing this. I had 25 years of seeing this by the time this happened. So I knew it was not going to get better. I wasn't guessing. I knew. And so I just wrote him a letter and I, I went around the house and threw away everything he'd ever given me, the cards, the candy, that the flowers, that kind of stuff. I threw it all away. I wrote him and I, I spent a tossing, turning night arguing with whether I was ever going to talk to him again. Um, and uh, um, I wrote him a, a note that said, you know, I was, this is such a near miss. I really had high hopes for us. Um, for there to be in us. It's not going to work out. I like you too much to just be buddies. Um, you know, there's not any really coming back from our conversation. Um, and so I'm going to have to move on. I wish you all the best. Um, and then I signed my name mm -hmm. and he sent back a letter that nearly melted my, my computer screen. Yes. It was an, an email. And uh, I didn't even actually read it. I had, I live in a small town, so everybody knows everybody. And I happened to know a lot of people who knew him. And I showed a couple of these people the letter and they said, yeah, never read that. It's so mean spirited. It's so insulting. So I didn't, I didn't ever actually read more. I could tell after the first sentence, like, do, do I need to carry this around in my head? Mm -hmm. Does he get to live there rent-free? I think not. So I never really read it, but um, yeah, it turned out that one of these people had known him in a personal context for quite some time and said, you know, that's the way he talked to women for decades. Yeah. So I got the validation after I made the choice that what I was seeing was really what I was seeing. But, you know, I, I made the choice before I got the validation. You don't really need that validation. I mean, it's nice to get, but you don't need that validation because it never gets better. If you look back at your own experience, you'll see that making excuses for men who are unkind and disrespectful never works out. Now, so then I realized, you know what, by not being divorced, when I met this guy, that's one of the reasons that it appealed to him was that he, he figured that I would never be totally available. That's probably one of the things that appealed to him. So I thought healthcare, no healthcare, I'll figure it out. I'm going to call Vic and ask for us to convert our legal separation into a divorce, which he said, yes, I filled out the paperwork. It's like three pieces of paper um, because a legal separation in my state, you do everything to get divorced. You just don't file a final paper. Mm. All the properties already divided. You've already made all the decisions. You just can either convert it back to a marriage or a divorce within a certain span of time. So I called and I said, you know, I, I think I'd like to do this. And he said, yeah, this year has sucked. Let's draw a line under it. So I went ahead and filed the papers and I thought, okay, I'm going to go ahead and get online and start dating. And I wrote an ad and I write ads for people all the time. So you can bet I wrote myself a good one. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I wrote an ad that uh, just some free advice here, write the ad about them, not about you. Mm -hmm. Know what you have to have and then make the ad a lighthearted, fun way to describe what you have to have and some of the things you want that will appeal to the kind of man you're looking for. That's the ad that I wrote. In my ad, I was a casting agent casting for the role of uh, the male lead in a fun rom-com. Mm. And I was describing what this, uh, what the future winner of this role would be like. And I laid it out there. I said, you know, he likes um, calling and making plans and courting as if it's 1990 and our, our female lead appreciates it and him. Things like that. <laughs> Great. I just laid it out there. This is who I want. And then I said at the end, this casting call expires in 30 days from, I named the date. Um, if you wish to apply for this role, please send a list of your qualifications and all good fit responses will be answered. <laughs> and I put that up on December 31st of 2020. January 6th of 2021, my sweetheart reached out to me. Mm -hmm. I met, you know, it was a very targeted ad. So I didn't, you talk about targeted ads, um, you know, like, companies send you targeted ads. This, this practically had 
my sweetheart's picture under it, except that I specified I wanted to go out with somebody close to my own height. And he's not close to my own height. He's a lot taller. Um, I actually have historically preferred to be with somebody close to my height. But um, he, he just, his picture should have been under that ad. He was just such a good fit. He said he was walking in a park when he saw my ad. He had meant to discontinue his membership to the place where we met. Mm -hmm. And they sent out pictures of, you know, the new people. And he saw my picture and he clicked through and he read my ad. And he said, normally, if he saw somebody he was interested in, he would like, you know, think about a response. And maybe the next day he would get back to it if he was still interested. He said, he turned on his heel. He ran home. He got his computer because he thought, I can't type this response on my phone. And he wrote just a, a, a terrific response mm. where he was applying. He, he felt like he... He said, it's the role of a lifetime, the one I was born to play. <laughs> <laughs> and he just went point by point and answered everything. And he acted like someone who already thought, you know what, this could be a priority, not just an option. Yeah. So I did all the things that, you know, I, I showed high status and where I want to get back to with this is I wasn't snobby. I don't want you to be snobby. I wasn't cold. I don't want you to be cold or bitchy. It's those things you've been told about hard to get. The reason they have a bad name is a, the idea that it's playing a game when really it's the human mating ritual. It's not a game. B that it's coy or manipulative or bitchy or cold, um, or in some way, uh, denigrating to men and to women. It's, it doesn't have to be any of those things. What it is, is knowing your worth, showing men that you can be trusted to let them have access to your physicality and your emotions as they have earned it. It's not just handed to them just because they are a bepenist individual who's asked you out. <laughs> I'm trying to get people to use that word. I, I'm coining the phrase bepenist individual. I'm trying to get people to use it. <laughs> um, that, that he earned it, that he went to the finals in, in, the the basketball game and he won the game he didn't nobody just handed him the trophy and that you can be straightforward about that I mean I did go out with this one guy at the same time because I didn't just date Carrie I went out with other people just like I teach people to do and there was this other guy that I met for a socially distanced walk who you know, I could just tell something was wrong. He didn't call to confirm the night before. He had done everything right up to that point, but he didn't call to confirm. Folks, I've never seen it work out when a guy didn't call to confirm. I just never have, ever. And what I tell my clients is, if he doesn't call to confirm the day before, just don't go. Just don't. And if he says, if, if on the rare chance, and it's rare, that he says, well, I showed up, where are you? You say, oh, you didn't confirm, so I thought we weren't going. That'll, that'll learn him. Like, don't allow people to treat you badly. That's not polite. So anyway, but I went because I do what I do for a living. And I thought, oh, data collection time. So, so <laughs> I went and I said, so what challenges have you found in dating? And he said, because they all know who I am, right? When we give each other our phone numbers, <laughs> they know my name. Mm -hmm. They go look me up and they see I'd written seven books. They know who I am. Right. So I, I said, so, um, you know, what have been your challenges? And he said, well, it seems like women want me to chase them. And I said, oh, that's interesting. What do you want? And he said, well, you know, I want women to call me and ask me out half the time. And I said, you know, I could get into why women don't like that. But I mean, you're not my client, but I will tell you that I don't ever go out with somebody who doesn't pursue me. It just doesn't work out for me. Quite apart from the science these men never treat me the way that I want to be treated and it doesn't work out and I'm not willing to take the chance. So I get that you and I aren't going to keep dating. I'm glad that we met today and I wish you well. And that mm -hmm. was it. Yeah. Bye. Yeah. Knowing your bottom line, knowing what you need is key. And this is a message you have said over and over today. And I totally agree with you. I, I think this conversation is really important because people often get the idea of being hard to get confused with high status and being high status or a high value woman, which you'll find a lot of stuff on the internet about, is not about, I think they're very different. I mean, so what a high value woman is in on the internet is, is somebody who, as I said at the beginning, is somebody who plays games, who 
you know, makes a man do the work and they, they're coy and they're manipulative and they change their personality really. And what you're advocating for is know your worth, be upfront, be straightforward. Don't give excuses for the inexcusable because one deal breaker is enough to make the most incredibly sounding man totally not right for you. And we have to pay attention to those things. I think we often see, well, well, you know, but the sex was good or he was so good looking or he has a good job, you know, and, and we focus on things that don't matter as much as is he showing up? Is he a person of value? Is he a person who's trustworthy? Are his words and actions matching? Like you said, it's you don't just accept somebody because they give you a nice gift and send you chocolate. Obviously, that doesn't always work out, especially if they're flower, you know, putting putting all that up, up there up front. So I really appreciate this conversation. Uh, how how can people best find you? No, oh, it's really easy. They can go to love factually.co it's not .com it's .co love factually with an f .co and you can see links to my two main books I've got some short books out there that aren't linked there but uh, my two books that are out in audio e and paperback are there which is love factually 10 proven steps from I wish to I do and love factually for single parents and those dating them and uh, you can so you can click through there if you want and you can get free content on both of those books. You can also click through to learn more about coaching or to email me. I answer all my emails for free. So um, yeah, I'm, I'd be thrilled to hear from you. And I really have enjoyed this conversation. It's, it's a topic that I really warm to. And if I could just make one more point, you know, you don't, mm -hmm. you really don't have to be coy. When, when Carrie and I met, I really liked him. And so I told him I did. And some people would say, oh, not hard to get. No, it's, let's let's look at a low status way to convey this information and then let, let's look at at a high self-esteem high self-worth high status way to do this the low status way would be i really like you do you like me <laughs> yeah okay what i said was you know i'm re i really like you i really have enjoyed this conversation and i hope you'll call again soon mm. i mean that's just putting it out there. I'm not, I don't sound clean, desperate. If he doesn't call again, I'll get over it. But if he doesn't call, I'm left in no lurch, no bind about it. Did I let him know? I, and just as a final parting gift, then there's a number one thing that any of us can do. Doesn't matter our age, our gender, our sexual orientation. None of it matters. The number one thing any of us can do to attract someone else is to say that we like them. Yeah. Not to say that we love them, not to say <laughs> we want to have their babies or that we want to help help take care of their grandkids, but to say that we like them. And obviously only say it if you mean it, but I really liked him. He was a good person. I didn't mean that I liked him romantically. I mean, I liked him as a person. Yeah. And, and he did call again. He called the very next night. And since we've met, there's only been one day that we haven't spoken. Hmm. Well, I love that. I love that you were upfront with him. You told him you liked him. I tell my clients the same thing. If you had a great time on a date and you really like somebody, let them know. I mean, mm -hmm. women are so afraid of it being too forward. And, and I'm like, men cannot read your mind. And often they get it wrong because we're being so coy and so discreet that we don't want to show too much. And we end up showing too little. And they think, well, that I don't think he really like. I don't think she really liked me. And so they may not ask you out again. And so imagine all the missed opportunities because we're not being upfront with each other without saying, I want to marry you on the first date. I think we just get confused about what all of this means. And so just practice being straightforward and honest and know your worth. Totally love the conversation. So thanks again. And I will post the link to our other conversation in the show notes. And um, thanks for coming on today. Thank you so much. It was, it was a joy. Thanks everybody for listening. And if you love our show, please rate and review us. Give us a great review on Apple Podcasts. It really means a lot to the continued success of the show. And as always, here's to your last first date. If you are ready to get unstuck, gain new tools, become more empowered, and finally find your last first date, I'd love to talk to you. 
fill out an application to be considered for a complimentary half hour love breakthrough session at lastfirstdate.com forward slash application. That's lastfirstdate.com forward slash application. I look forward to talking to you soon.